Good morning. How are you today? Um, so today I wanted to basically talk about there is a new lawmaker in Germany um, that is deaf. It's their first deaf German parliament uh, member. And so um, today is basically kind of discussing uh, what I know about and what I can find about deaf German history and comparing it to the United States deaf history and then looking at relationships between deaf German history and deaf US history in consideration of global deaf history as well. Um, and I'm actually kind of really interested in all of this. And to be honest, the reason I am doing this video today though, I am passionate of course, like my whole um, content, everything has always been about deaf history, deaf law, deaf access, deaf rights, like a lot of what I do has always been about that. But this specific topic, I got it from Vid IQ. Uh, I decided to test their content generation. I decided I'm going to test some of their ideas. Um, and I'm going to be very transparent. So anything that I have not made clear that I got from Vid IQ was my own idea to do. Um, all I got from this from VidIQ was just the suggestion of the idea. And let me show that to you real quick. Um, so in VidIQ, they have different things that they can do right here. Um, well, maybe it's because I have this. There it goes. It says first deaf lawmaker in German parliament reaction. Um, that was a suggested idea that they had for me that I saved and decided to do. And they give you like video ideas. Um, and they give you like, this is just a free version because I just wanted to test it out. So some of it, there is ableism behind some of their suggestions, you know, because it's an algorithm that is primarily created from hearing people. I may have too many things open because it doesn't want to load right now. But, um, I highly recommend checking out vidIQ and just seeing if some of the content ideas are right for you. It gives you, like, an entire overview of your channel, who's subscribing, who's looking at it. It gives you, like, top keyword opportunities related to what is being found on your, um, page for what you've already been ranking for. Um, and that's what I like about it, because you connect your YouTube channel and all the suggestions are analyzed based on what you're already doing um, with your YouTube. So I think that's like a really cool aspect about it. Um, and so yeah, whenever I'm using any kind of idea or any part of my videos from vidIQ, I'm going to be very clear with you guys about which part that is. So yeah, let's move on. We're going to do the damn thing. Um, and I really appreciate you joining me today. Hi, my name is Lexi, also known as and doing business as Deaf Child. In 2022, my company was listed as number 14 best Louisiana events companies and startups. I have been doing business as Deaf Child since 2013. I have my Bachelor of Science in Music Industry Studies and Business Administration, and deafness runs in my family genetically. Speech is not fully accessible to me. And I've got about 50 certifications in marketing and sales that you can find at nolaDeafChild.com. All right, so I basically spent a lot of time uh, prepping some material I wanted to review. And today, hopefully, um, we'll be able to get all of that kind of covered. Um, and so, yeah, I'm a little distracted. Okay, so the first thing is that we're discussing and the main topic and theme of everything for today is that the German parliament is welcoming its first deaf lawmaker. And this was published by the Associated Press um, from March uh, 21st, 2024. So within a little over the past week as of the making of this video. And to be honest, I kind of just rolled out of bed and was like, let's go live today. <laughs> Um, so I'm here drinking my coffee right now, I'm in my pajamas, and um, I'm chilling. It's Saturday, okay? I've been stressing, so I need to clean my house, and <laughs> why would I go start cleaning my house when I can make a YouTube video instead? You know what I mean? 
It's called productivity. Um, so, the German parliament welcoming its first deaf lawmaker is kind of a big deal because it's 2024. Um, and it is historic because it's marking the first time something happened for deaf people in our history. Um, and even if it's within Germany, I feel like every time there is a win for, you know, deaf community, no matter where it is in the world, it's like, I think it's beneficial for all deaf people. And I feel that way about all forms of anti-discrimination or overcoming obstacles in the way of oppression. And you could say, well, parliament is a systemic structure upholding nationalism and you know, problematic shit because all countries are in this day and age in a way. Not all countries, but most countries, you know what I mean? Um, particularly, you know, I don't know if the words are coming out right with what I mean to say because I haven't learned enough in order to um, accurately express the ideas that I want to convey, if that makes sense. Um, but, you know, the, how you get there is processing it and trying. So, I cannot pronounce this lady's name. I, I, if I were to guess, I would say maybe it's Heike Hubach, based on what I know of German linguistics. But I don't know shit about Germany or German linguistics. I just know some random names I've had to pronounce here and there over my life. But, you know, um... I don't know how to pronounce their name, but this lady, we're just going to call her Miss H. She um, joined the house this week. You know, she narrowly missed out in 2021, but she became a replacement for this other person whose name I definitely also can't pronounce. If I had to guess, it would be Uli Grach. Sorry if I said that wrong. Um, I'm not going to try to pronounce these names. I can't. What the hell? Oh, I'm sorry I said what the hell. That's probably xenophobic of me. I'm working on myself. Okay, my bad. I'm working on it. Um, okay, moving on. So, the what I really like about it is how they describe her accuracy. Uh, I said accuracy, but I meant like access. I like how they describe her access into getting this position, you know. They have a specific place for her. She has a sign language interpreter and all of that. I was never able to get that type of access in my class. Like, there was, you know, like, teachers would be moving around so much. Like, no one, nothing was ever stagnant, you know, or in employment. Like, it's so hard to get these types of, like, access where people will accommodate you. And I know in some scenarios it's not possible, but there will be times where it is possible, but they just don't do it because they don't want to. Um... And that was what was the case in the past with legal representation in the United States. So I also believe that may have been a thing in Germany as well. Um, so, yeah, I'm really happy for her. Uh, Miss H finally made Parliament, and I think that's great. Um, and this picture right here, this is known as, like, the death of pause, you know? Um... So there, that's like a, the picture is also kind of monumental because it's a deaf cultural tidbit right here as well. So it's great to see the deaf cultural representation for her. Um, and then I also wanted to point out, like, so when I was going into this, what I know about deaf history in Germany is strictly tied to what I know in relation to the United States history off the top of my head. So going into making this video, I was like, let me look up some information about the deaf history of Germany. Well, there is not much information available. There are some specific key historical moments you can find online, but it's really hard to find um, more relevant information to what's happening today and what's happened like to impact the legal aspects in a way. So what I was able to find was some information about death in World War II. I was able to find about the German death movement um, and, you know, a few other things here and there. And then from there it goes into Wikipedia 
and you start finding out about the sterilization of deaf people in Nazi Germany and then the eugenics and deaf people in Nazi Germany. That's like a big portion of um, when you look up the deaf history of Germany, that's a big portion of what you find. Um, and then looking into some of these sources here, so the deaf history in World War II, for example, um, and this is published by Deaf History of Europe, and they basically discuss the amount of deaf people who were killed or sterilized. Um, and even children, you know. Um, and so there's things like that where you, you take that into place and it all comes down into the eugenics about the whole idea of a master race and everything like that. Um, and yeah, and it was basically mostly Jewish deaf people in this case were deemed unfit to live. Um, but they also were killing deaf people even if they were not Jewish. They were just like, fuck all these deaf bitches, you know? Um, and so while the Holocaust primarily targeted Jewish people, he didn't stop there, you know? You could be targeted for any number of reasons. Um... And then there was a book in the Humanities and Social Sciences Net Online. Basically, it's published an article about a book, um, and it's called, the book is called From Pathology to Public Sphere, The German Deaf Movement, 1848 to 1914. Um, and this German Deaf Movement, this article, I actually haven't even read this, so let's do kind of like a little reaction together, or first read together here. So I cannot pronounce this person's name, but it talks about how this German deaf movement from 1848 to 1914 was about the emergence and expression of a new way of being deaf in Germany. And it occurred between the revolution of 1848 and the outbreak of the First World War. Um, and what was notable is, you know, deaf people were coming out as, you know, the peer groups, lobbyists, organizers, writers, and thinkers, and things like that, and having this deaf pride of a formation in Germany was actually pretty huge, because um, there was Hebrew law that actually kind of taught down on deaf people that was common uh, rhetoric, and then there was also, like, Plato and Aristotle, they would also be writing negatively in regards to deaf people um, about how we could not, did not have the capability of having reason and things like that. Um, and then in the middle of this time period is in 1880 is where um, Alexander Graham Bell and the Milan Conference of 1880 works to get sign language banned around the world. So this revolution also kind of turns into, in a way, um, you know, that's, that's another way it is a revolution. Because what started off as more of like a renaissance becomes a revolution because you, you're going into this renaissance, into this emergence, and then you end up having to be this social advocate for your human rights um, in an unexpected way. So, yeah, I do find it interesting in relation to um, our reading on Alexander Graham Bell's memoir upon the formation of a deaf variety of the human race, that this study is focusing on people in the 19th century, which is the 1800s, like AGB, and what was known as people with congenital deafness, you know, meaning you were born deaf. Um, so yeah, this person believes that the capitalization of deaf is an is a, um, that 
That's interesting. She said she refrains from capitalizing death because she believes it would impose a unified self-image and cultural identity on a diverse deaf population that included both signers and non-signers. That is interesting. So she doesn't want us to be unified. I don't know if this person is deaf or not. I have not looked into these people. Um, if these are hearing people speaking over deaf issues, you already know how I feel about that. It's just discrimination. If it's a deaf person, it's like this is their way of processing the discrimination that they've experienced, I guess. I don't know. So I don't know enough about that review to discuss that. So I'm going to try and focus less on that and try and focus on the point of the movement. Um... But yeah, so basically I'm going to stop there and stop trying to analyze all of this because I don't have the context to from German history and I can't even pronounce these names. But I'm just going to focus on the first part of this right here in this first sentence, you know. this um, I said first sentence, but I meant like first few sentences. So yeah, the revolution was basically about um, renaissance, resurgence, and deaf identity, but within a German frame. Um, and then another uh, source I got from the deaf history of Europe regarding 1778 for the first school for the deaf in Germany. I do find that interesting because I believe that the first school for the deaf in the United States formed in the early 1800s, so it was about 20 years later. So I do think that that's interesting because in some ways I find that Germany used things that were happening in America as precedent to make things happen in, in Germany. And in other ways, German, what was happening in Germany happened before what was happening in the United States. So I do find that um, pretty fascinating with how, because I will show you the connection about the global deaf history in a bit, where there's resources for, you know, the country setting precedent for what was happening with each other. Um, but just like America, you know, these people were trying to oralize their death at first. Um, and so the, it kind of shows like there has been very similar, even though what, what happened in the time frame was different, the series of events were different, the order, the history, the impacts were all different. There's still very similar events occurring in both places. And I do think that's extremely interesting. Because at this time, the dissemination of information is so slow, you know. Um, and then UNESCO has a little thing about um, German sign language on here. And... I just thought it was interesting to read a little bit about German sign language because it speaks to the cultural and social foundation. Um, but, okay, so remember how I was speaking about the Milan Conference of 1880? There were resolutions passed that meant that sign language could no longer be uh, used in schools for deaf people, and that was representing a political and social setback for deaf people. So even at, you know, back in this time period, what was happening in America impacted Germany because the Milan Conference of 1880, where sign language was banned all around the world, that was led by Alexander Graham Bell. And he was Scottish, he was born in Scotland, but then he moved to the United States and became a U.S. citizen. Um, so I do find that kind of fascinating, the way it's all, it's all these bitches are connected. You know what the fuck I mean? And they apparently didn't get political change until the 1970s, very similar time frame. Um, so yeah, I do find, I find that fascinating. So, going back in time, I found this article about deaf people in Hitler's Europe, an international conference that brings attention to the roles deaf people played during the Nazi regime. So, um, So right here, it says deaf people are among those who were killed by the Nazis during the time. 
Some because they were Jews, others because as congenitally deaf people, they were considered defective and biologically inferior. And notice the word defective. Notice that what the time frame that um you know the notice the time frame that the Holocaust happened in was you know like around 1930s 1940s, and it was in 1883 that Alexander Graham Bell published a memoir upon the formation of a deaf variety of the human race, where he called us defective, and he was the president of the Eugenic Society, and look where it just manifested. You know what I mean? You can't tell me that's not connected. Um, because I fully believe that Alexander Graham Bell's memoir was propaganda for the um, influence and the execution of forced sterilization laws, marriage bans, etc. Um, in the United States. And I also believe that there is documentation, which we're going to get to, you know, that that shows where Germany may have possibly been using what was happening in America regarding eugenics as pre legal precedent to do the same thing there. Um, so I, I do find that interesting. And you know what I also find it interesting? I never knew this. Look at this. Nazism is national socialism. Wow. Has anybody ever looked into this? Because what about the socialist movements today? You know, what's perceived as socialist. This is blowing my fucking mind. You know what I mean? I never realized that Nazi stood for National Socialism. I'm going to have to come back to this one. We're going to have to come back to this on a whole nother life, potentially, because that's blowing my fucking mind. I feel like there's some there's something here to this concept and the correlation of political movements today and the labeling of social ideologies. I gotta come back to that on another time. I'm processing some shit here. Um, so, the German court made a decision that sterilization of deaf people and individuals with disabilities by the Nazis was not persecution. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. So, because of all this background, this created um, the idea for a conference in 1993 uh, for people to teach this history, which is what this article is about. Wow. You know, the fact that Nazism, Nazi is National Socialism, is really blowing my mind. Okay, I got to come back to this. Um, I'm going to move on because that's not the point of this fucking live, and I'm going to go home on a whole nother tangent. Okay, but notice here, the Nazi geneticist said that hereditary deafness needed to be removed from the gene pool. Isn't this some out? You know what? You know what? Yeah, we need to do this. What the hell? Alexander Graham Bell. Yeah, that deserved it. <clears throat> What the fuck? That was an Alexander Graham Bell moment. Like, even, you know what I mean? Like, what in the Alexander Graham Bell was that shit? What the fuck was that? Um, so, yeah. Fucking, I don't even think I can, oh, okay, there's only one more page. I was about to say, I don't think I can finish this bitch. Um, But yeah, look at this though. One of the survivors said we had to demonstrate the complexity or we were able to demonstrate the complexity of the topic. It isn't just a simple victimization story. How fucked up is it that you have to say I'm not victimizing myself? Oh my God. Um, so yeah. 
I'm gonna have to do a whole nother like thing on processing this information. Um, so then another thing that I was trying to look up was German death legal history because at first we, I was like, okay, that's German death history in general. Let me get some context here, some mindset, some like placement here, find my bearings. So, so now we're like, okay, let's look into the German death legal history. And you know what's interesting is I really couldn't find much because most of what I found was in the same information that we just looked at. Um, and I thought that was fascinating. Or it was information that I've already pulled up before from other various sources that I do have pulled up to show you guys. Um, so I do think it's very interesting, the limitation, and I don't know if it's a relation to search engine result pages can be entirely connected to who you are, where you're located, and everything like that. So say if someone lives in Germany, their search engine result page might have way better results than mine, for example. But just the fact that, say, for whatever reason, this is the algorithm that is being fed in the United States regarding this history, and it's not full details, part of me believes it's because of the suppression of content that could highlight corruption. Um, so, Germany, they didn't recognize sign language until 2002. Um, I believe it was somewhere between 1960s and 1980s. It definitely wasn't past the 1980s. I think it was like 1970-something. Maybe I'm wrong. But this dude named Stocko, S-T-O-K-O-E, um, helped get American Sign Language recognized as an official lang language when he published his findings about it being an official language and then relatively soon after it got recognized in the United States American Sign Language as a language. Um, so it took them arguably between 20 to 30, maybe 40 years, but I think around 20 years longer to get recognition of their language. Um, and I kind of think that may speak to the greater setbacks that were placed upon them by the amount of deaf people that were killed during the Holocaust. So from there, I was like, let me look up German deaf lawyers. You know, let's check that out. And all I could find from my American search engine result page is mostly like American German deaf people and Haben Germa to and I'm so sorry I don't think I said her name right to my understanding is not German I believe she is Ethiopia from Ethiopia and I cannot say this country's name right I'm so sorry Eritrea is that right I'm sorry um if I can so I do think it's interesting because she's a deaf law lawmaker I do find it interesting, like, we've got American deaf politicians showing up for American search engine result pages for the search result term German deaf lawyers. And it's way harder to just go look like you'd have to do way more work to go actually find a German deaf lawyer. Why is it so hard? You know? And I think that speaks to suppression of content. Um, and I did want to put all of this into context, so I am going to play... Um, some of the videos that I've done, they're just like, these. I double checked this time, you know, this time they're definitely one minute videos. Um, we're going to look at some of the My Deaf History lessons that I've done to put this into context, the connection between what I know about German history before and um, American history, as well as what has happened in American pairing these two, you can see more of that background here. So this video is about how German Nazis later adopt U.S. deaf sterilization laws. Um, and it talks about the Girl Scouts too, but we're, we're here for the German Nazi part. In 1907, Indiana passed the first sterilization law based on eugenics. The deaf community were one of the groups targeted for forced barbaric sterilization. But in late 1930s, half the states had forced sterilization laws uh, based on the eugenics of Bell and others. California's compulsory sterilization law became a model for Nazi Germany. Five years later, a late deaf woman named Juliet Gordon Lowe founded the Girl Scouts of America. 
So I guess hearing people are okay with letting deaf people around their kids as long as the deafness wouldn't pass to their kids? I don't know. I don't know what hearing people had against us deaf people because look, I love Girl Scout cookies. Are you telling me you don't want Girl Scout cookies? Ask me anything you like. So, that puts into context, you know, the forced sterilization laws were happening in the United States like 20, 30 years before they were happening in Germany. You know what I mean? Um, so that was how that legal precedent was set there. Um, and I kind of fully believe it's all connected. And the only proof I really have from that is the timeline of the events and the way that some of the global laws and global events um, seem to have the same result in multiple places. So, then this other article from Handspeak, you know, where it talks about Alexander Graham Bell. I'm bringing this up again because, like I said, you know, I wanted to just highlight that he was the president of the second international, the honorary president, that is, but he was the second international congress of eugenics. And that was in 1921. I think he had already died or died maybe soon after because I'm pretty sure AGB died in the 1920s, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so, uh, he may have been dead at this point, but he was still pretty proud to be a eugenicist, and I believe that that is evident in his memoir, as well as other things he has published and said and done that we could look into. Um, and the eugenicist made a proposal for legislation to forbid intermarriage by death for the fear of a growing deaf race. And I think that is extremely connected to the fear-mongering AGB was putting into place of deaf people through his memoir. Um, so, and then he says he did not directly support the ban of intermarriage because he supported other approaches directly in terms of what he actually did, but he still did definitely talk about indirectly the intermarriage ban. You know what I mean? So, what this, what this means is there's nothing technical proving AGB to the actual marriage ban because he didn't technically do anything to make it happen beyond write his memoir and talk about it. You know what I mean? He talked about it want, him wanting it to happen, but he didn't actually do it. It's kind of what my issue is. But because he was talking about it, that's how it was done. So he's trying to say because he only talked about it, it, it it's not his fault it was done. Nah, fuck you, bitch. Um, so, you know. And I honestly think that's like, as we saw, because he's the one who got in 1880 the Milan Conference sign language ban, that impacted Germany. So it's all connected. Um, and just pulling up my source, um, that in 1927, there was a Supreme Court ruling by vote of 821 that led to 70,000 forced sterilizations. Um, so I just want to put that up there. And this is in the United States. So in the United States, German history and Nazi history is taught as this horrible atrocity that happened in Germany. And German's bad. German's horrible. Not real. Like, that's not how I feel. I'm just saying that's kind of the impression that the, um, U.S. history books will give you when you're teaching you about what happened in with the Holocaust. But then when it comes to, like, slavery, the U.S. history is over here. Like, slavery was fine. We were teaching them shit. They should be grateful we allowed them to be our slaves. You know what I mean? So I'm not saying I agree with either of those concepts. I'm just saying look at the stark contrast with how... Um, U.S. history teaches about the Holocaust versus how U.S. history teaches about other social atrocities. You know, I, I find that fascinating. And the reason being is I kind of think, yes, I do think there is possibly a layer of racism where part of the reason U.S. history, US history books will appeal to, um, like, Zionist tropes, you know, and... Part of it could be because, you know, most of the people impacted by Nazis were white and the whole, like, white supremacy aspects. I do believe that that is a thing. Um, 
but I also believe that another factor too contributing to this is American history books. They don't want you to learn how detailed and how big the eugenics the eugenics movement is in the United States. They would rather you think it's all about Germany that it was Ger- that was a German thing that wasn't happening in America. That was Germany. That's kind of the impression you are given. Um, up until you're able to educate yourself outside of colonial institutions in the United States. It, you know, I'm, well, basically I'm self-projecting based on what I was taught with history um, and how I'm processing on learning that, if that makes sense. So moving on, this deaf history timeline here, what I was talking about. So in 1000 BC, Hebrew law provided that the deaf had limited rights to property and marriage. In 355 BC, Aristotle said those who are born deaf all become senseless and incapable of reason. And then in 360 BC, Socrates mentioned the use of science by the deaf Plato's Cratylus. And so- Socrates discusses innate intelligence, and he claims that deaf people are incapable of language and ideas. Um, and so all of this shit continues, all this ideology continues into the history. And you might be thinking, this is 1000 BC, 350 BC. Like, look at this. This is the ideology that started back then and then continued. Oh, and you know what? Okay, so in 1591, let's look at this. Um, Alberti, a German physician, published the first book of any kind specifically regarding deafness. This course on deafness and speechlessness. He stated that hearing and speech were separate functions. Alberti believed that deaf people were rational, capable of thought, even though they lacked speech. He showed that the deaf can read lips, understand speech, and read without the ability to hear. So I do think that's interesting that while historically all of these other things were happening where deaf people were kind of being put down, there are still these movements of deaf pride happening in um, German. And this dude was hearing, I believe. I believe he was a hearing advocate. So... um, I kind of think that is interesting. But Samuel, is that Heineke? He's the one that established that first school for the oral deaf in Germany. He can suck my fucking dick. All right. Um, so, yeah. I'm not going to go through this whole history. Uh, oh, but you know what else is interesting? Beethoven, Germany. Yeah, love you, bitch. What's up? Um, you know what's interesting? The first thing I did when I got on FamilySearch.org was try and see if I was related to Beethoven. <laughs> I'm not. Fucking. Um, so, yeah. I think, you know, I honestly think that Beethoven being deaf and having the music that he did hi- highly contributed to positive deaf um, representation for deaf people, and I think having, I think that is an example of why deaf representation is so important, because when all of this other negative things are happening, you know, deaf people still have this role model to look to. Um, so yeah, I'm going to leave up this timeline, because I feel like there was another reason I wanted to bring this up that I am forgetting about. Oh yes, 1907, some more proof about the forced sterilization laws being passed here. And this is where I first got, not even like the idea, but first read that it could be possible that uh, California's compulsory sterilization law could become a model for Nazi Germany. This is where I first figured that connection. I was like, oh shit, what the fuck? Yeah. Um... And then I want to look at another video that I did before, and it's called uh, Where the U.S. Did Forced Sterilization Become Legal? And so just so we can see kind of like the spread of, you know, how bad it was. Today we're going to talk about where in the United States is forced sterilization legal. Before I show you, can you guess which states have legalized forced sterilization? I consider forced sterilization genocide. According to National Women's Law Center, in 2022, 31 states in the United States allowed legalized forced sterilization. This forced sterilization in this 
case is particularly targeted at disabled people. North Carolina and Alaska are the only two states in the U.S. that have outright banned forced sterilization. There are exceptions to all of this, but generally speaking, the South and bits of the Midwest um, and Central United States uh, are iffy on whether or not it's legalized. Whereas the East and West Coast and everywhere else have it So yeah, so I was basically just summarizing exactly what I'm showing you now is the max here of the states that allow forced sterilization um, in the United States. And so I'm just putting it out there, you know, um, the eugenics is still happening. It's often talked about and thought of like it's this way far out distant thing. Um, but it's still impacting everybody today. And we don't like to think about it because that's horrible. But I mean, it's the truth, you know, and it's important to acknowledge it. And there's also, of course, disparities within this. So any of these laws are obviously going to impact multiply oppressed people even more. So, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. And in this next one, um, I want to talk about, is there precedent for America to be a model for Nazi eugenics? Today we're going to talk I forgot to mute my mic. I don't want it to echo. About if German Nazis really modeled their sterilization laws in the Holocaust based on what was happening in the United States. Like everything in history, everything I've discussed has different historians with different perspectives on what happened. And I'm just sharing with you what I think is true based on my experience, which includes my own personal biases. I want to look at two different articles I got from the National Library of Medicine. This first article basically backs up the timeline of what I'm going to show you in the next article, just basically stating that the laws were passed in the United States before Germany. This next article argues that eugenics became popular based on an American vision for creating a master race. So, yeah. Um... One of the articles that we were just, I'm, we're going to look at both of those articles real quick. Um, the one on eugenics and human rights in general is talking about how during the Nazi era in Germany, you know, um, because of eugenics, there was a sterilization of so many freaking people. Um, and of course, the death camps, you know, and that many people associate eugenics with Nazis. Um, but... They don't even know that, like, you know, even Sweden had sterilized people around the 1930s and 70s um, in order to, because of ableism, you know. And, and in fact, the sports sterilization blossomed in the United States, Canada, Britain, Scandinavia, and everywhere else in Europe, and in parts of Latin America, Asia. Um, so it wasn't unique to Nazis. It can and does happen everywhere um and i'm highly summarizing what this person wrote whoever the people that wrote it daniel j kev i can't say your name dude is it kevels um but this professor this is this professor's ideas and basically his words almost kind of not really uh well you know what i mean i didn't i didn't read it right for word but i'm saying his shit. i don't know about what the fuck i'm saying makes sense i'm trying to credit the dude but Anything that I say that is his idea should be credited to him, but not everything I'm saying should be credited to him because my opinions is not a reflection of him, but what he said is not me taking credit for it. I don't fucking, you know what, good enough. Um, so his, I'm just going to look over his summary points like I did in the video, you know. Um, Basically, look, if you think about it, it was in the 20s and 30s that these were happening in the United States, Canada, and Sweden. Um, and then it didn't happen until 10, 20, 10 to 20 years later in Germany. So we're not often taught about that. And then 
that's if you also don't count into the eugenics that was happening with slavery with all of that history that I am not qualified or equipped to speak on so I'm just going to stick to the death history part of it as well because that's the main focus but I'm just saying I'm not dismissing or denying that history I'm only I'm just going to stick to talking about the death history aspect but that was also eugenics you know um so yeah and then there was this other article called was Nazi eugenics created in the US and it was reviewed by this dude named Garland E Allen um and yeah and it's about Edwin Black's war against the weak and um, eugenics in America's campaign to create a master race um and I'm really disturbed by their use of this term racial hygiene. That just sounds so fucked up. It's like triggering to want to learn more about this information. Um, so, yeah. The whole concept, like, is just this the term just this uh, like looking at the legal precedent of what was happening in the United States because this is basically just saying you know this shit was happening over there before it even happened here um and so it's just also keeping that in mind um and this also they also have the idea that the American and German eugenicists were in close contact with each other especially after World War One and that they were working together in international organizations and that they were following and even reporting on developments in eugenics in each other's countries. Um, and right here it says the Germans did in fact borrow much of their 1933 law for the prevention of hereditary defective offspring, the so-called sterilization law, from the model sterilization law driven up, up for the various states by Harry H. Laughlin, super, you know, um, superintendent of the ERO, and a number of American eugenicists were impressed with the Nazi eugenical laws after 1933. Um, and right here it says, but all this has been long been known and written about. When why is it not taught in U.S. history? They don't want us to know. Because if they admit that they were committing eugenics against white people, they would have to start admitting more shit about slavery too, I guess, I don't know. Okay, so now I wanna look at um, just kind of like the death, dark legal ages, getting out of that, death law in general, and a few key players in death law in US history. Today we're gonna to be talking about death representation in the law. In 1883, Joseph G. Parkinson is thought to be the first deaf attorney. In 1908, the U.S. Supreme Court licensed the first black deaf blind attorney named Roger O'Kelly. Roger O'Kelly is the last known deaf attorney until Harold Diamond and Lowell Myers in the 50s. Between the 1930s and until 1970, it is considered the dark ages of deaf legal representation. Many deaf blame AGB for that. The 504 protests in 1977 for the 1973 Rehab Act led to deaf people gaining admission to college and law school. This didn't really stop discrimination though. In 1982, Michael A. Chadoff was the first deaf attorney to go to the Supreme Court using a transcription device. In 2010, less than 1%, barely above 0% of attorneys identified as deaf or hard of hearing. So yeah, there was a long history in the United States with trying to um, basically get legal representation. And, you know, for a long time, there was only like one or two deaf lawyers that could be found for like a really, really long time. And then for another period of time, there were no deaf lawyers. And um, it was known as the dark deaf legal ages of representation because we had no... Uh, we had no community in the law, you know what I mean? And what what people were in the law were one or two positions who themselves, they were fighting so much oppression that they could barely move the needle, you know? Um, and so the first deaf lawyer that went to Supreme Court, 
So this was published in 1982. Um, and that would be Michael Chadoff, who's deaf, and he can speak, but he is deaf. And he used um, transcription devices in order to uh, be an attorney. And I'm trying to find if the year of that this article is published was the same year he became. I, I don't think the article says. Um, but so this article was published in 1982. And so I do believe that he went first went to the Supreme Court in 1982. And so, you know, in the United States, it took a long time to move that needle. And this is a 61-page document here called Breaking the Sound Barriers, How the Americans with Disabilities Act and Technology Have Enabled Deaf Lawyers to Succeed. Um, honestly, I kind of think maybe I should do a live where I read and break down this, art this document, because if I did it with Alexander Graham Bell, I should do it for this too, right? Like... So I think I am going to do that. But, um, let me write this down. Fucking. Oh, sorry. Um, John F. Stanton is a deaf lawyer. And he wrote an article uh, about deaf, dark, legal ages of representation that I had summed up in that one-minute video, or I had tried to. I basically tried to sum up a 60-page document in a one-minute video there. Um, and so, you know, he this goes into getting accommodations, the types of accommodations used, um, sign language interpreters, uh, you know, minimal accommodations, um, and, you know, then it goes into oral interpreters and computer-assisted real-time interpreting, also known as CART, which is what Michael Chadoff used, um, experiences of deaf lawyers prior to the ADA's passage, uh, like, so, like, the late 19th and early 20th century, it goes into, um, all of that, so I think I'm definitely going to do a live just to break down this document, but, what I've been specifically talking about is the pre-ADA modern era, the 1930s to 1970s, the dark ages of legal representation, um, and theories for this and all of that. Um, so that is what we want to pay attention to. So this guy, um, he really broke it down to what were the issues, what were the legal aspects, and he broke it down by time period. And so I think I'm going to do a whole nother live because I honestly own this because it's so much content here. But let's get to this conclusion. Um, so at the end of this, even around, he was talking about how um, lawyers in general have been facing like really tough times, you know, with getting um, hiring. So whenever that is happening, is definitely impacting the deaf community as well. Um, so because of income disparity, you know, anytime the economy is bad for all people, it's kind of worse for people who are, have those income disparity barriers. Um, so yeah. The conclusion is basically talking about how even though there's new deaf lawyers, we're still struggling to get laws passed and to have our voices heard for legal representation in society. Um, and so that's like the whole point. And so I can only imagine, like, if in the U.S. it's taken us so long to get to be this place where we are now. Um, and if Germany, I believe it could, they could be further behind us with some of these legal issues because so many deaf people were killed. Part of the reason that we are not validated now is because there's always going to be more hearing people than deaf people. So the fact that um, they killed so many deaf people, meaning there's even less deaf people to fight, and deaf people are even worse off in that way there with the community and the sustainability, like it's got to be even harder, you know what I mean? Um, 
Okay, so now we're going to go into talking about the deaf and hard of hearing bar association, which John Stanton, whose article we just looked at, is part of. Today I'm going to discuss contemporary deaf legal leadership. The deaf and hard of hearing bar association was created in 2013. The first historic admission of a sponsored group of attorneys that were deaf and hard of hearing from the deaf and hard of hearing bar association occurred in 2016. Between 2010 and 2016, it is estimated that the number of deaf lawyers grew from 200 to 250. John Stanton, the same guy that wrote the 61-page article used in My Deaf History Lesson 27, was the one that sponsored these attorneys into their first historic admission. While there were deaf attorneys before, this marked significant inclusion of deaf access and deaf culture that had never really been seen before. Currently, three groups of attorneys have been sworn into the Supreme Court via the Deaf and Hard of Hearing Bar Association. There are only 34 attorneys admitted to the U.S. Supreme Court via the DHSBA. I might need those I think that's autoplay. Okay. So, the Deaf and Hard of Hearing Bar Association in the United States, um, you know, because of all of these barriers that were put into place, making it so hard for deaf people to get access and legal representation in society in the United States, they created a bar association just for them so they could have access, have a sense of community, and be able to communicate. Um, and, yeah. But, um, I do think it's very fascinating um, to consider the legal ramifications of how deaf people being shut out for so long, you know, in deaf law, now that we're finally getting deaf people in, what is it going to take to move the needle forward? And then you may also notice, like, why are all of these bitches white? Um, well, I don't have, I didn't pull up a stat on this, but we, let's pull up this stat. Black lawyers were about 5% of attorneys in the United States. There are only around 250 attorneys in the U.S. Uh, uh, that in the U.S. that are deaf. Um, I mean, does it show me how many lawyers are told in the U.S.? It just told me by state. Oh, okay, there are, apparently there are more than 1.3 million lawyers in the U.S. according to ABA profile, the legal profession here. Um, the American Bar Association. So, out of out of over a million attorneys, only 250 are deaf. That's a really low rate. But I, I can only think of one black deaf attorney, um, and I can't remember his name. Did I talk about him? He's a black deafblind attorney. That's not Herman Germa. Herman Germa is the first black deafblind attorney. I love her, but she's not. She's the first black, black deafblind person to graduate from Harvard, but she's not the first black deafblind attorney. Um, hold on. Let me pull up that Bridges timeline. Okay, so Okay, keep in mind right here because this matters. 
1860s, deaf schools for black children opened in 1860s because of the segregation of early residential schools and the segregation of dorms and classrooms later led to two sign languages in America, American Sign Language and Black American Sign Language. Both have tremendous cultural significance and identity. Gallaudet University did not admit black deaf students until 1950. Oh, you know what I was getting confused with? I think I was getting confused with Andrew Foster, but no, that's not right. Oh, I guess it was Macon Balling Allen. Um. No, it was Roger O'Kelly. I knew it. I knew it. We talked about Roger O'Kelly. We just talked about Roger O'Kelly. Okay. Bruh. I knew, I knew that I was like, I was freaking myself out. I was like, okay, no, no, no. I knew this. Okay. So the first, that's so funny um, to me because I was like, let's just look at how many black deaf lawyers are there in general in the U.S. So about 5% of all lawyers are black. There's 250 um, deaf lawyers. So if 5% if five of 250 of them then are black, it doesn't tell me that because so we never know which statistics. It could be wrong. Um, I wish there were some studies on that, but there's not that much information. So you'll notice based on these stats, though, what my fucking point is, the legal representation for deaf people is heavily whitewashed based on this information. I'm sorry, it took me so long to get to this point. I do think it matters though, because like we pointed out, like the National Association for the Deaf claims to be the first human rights organization since the 1860s, but they didn't allow black deaf people in till after the 1960s. So I feel there's also, we can uh, correlate these same type of social issues also impacting the law. And our social progress in that regard as well. And I do think that matters because when you look at all of this, you know, like, okay, great. We're finally getting some deaf representation, but why are all these bitches white? You know what I mean? I think Rachel Arfa might, might have some um, Arab lineage, but um, I don't know if that makes sense. Or if that's even appropriate for me to say. I just noticed that and it, I felt like you know, it speaks to, a, in a lot of disability spaces, it's all whitewashed, and I just happen to notice. Um, okay, so moving on, let's talk about how the Supreme Court justice, you know, now they're using sign language to swear in deaf lawyers. So back in the day, they were refusing to use sign language to have any sort of interpretation, but now they're doing it, and I will notice that it's been kind of made a spectacle when it happens. Like, look how accessible and great we are. Look, look. And it's like on one level, if it were from deaf perspective, talking about how excited we are for access or moving the needle or finally getting, um, you know, some sort of recognition and for our culture and in society, I would kind of like understand that perspective. But a lot of the articles that I see is kind of like these hearing people like, look how great we are. We're providing them access now. We are the shit. <laughs> Fucking bitches. Um. Anyhow, so moving on, you know, it was a really big deal whenever they had these historic admissions uh, from the deaf and hard of hearing attorneys to the U.S. Supreme Court because um, all of these barriers have been put in place. So, you, like, having estimated there's only like 250, what's 5% of 250? Is that 25 um, you know what I mean? I don't know. I suck at math. Let's pull that up. Somebody called me twice. I'm going to call them back after I end this, but I'm like, if they're calling me on a Saturday, it can't be that important. Oh, 
percent of 250 is 12.5 so based on the statistics i know i can estimate there's probably 12 or 13 black deaf lawyers in the united states um isn't that interesting like no representation there what the hell um and so now i just kind of want to talk about like going from these dark legal ages of deaf representation to where we are now what does that look like and that's going to be in this history lesson with rachel arfa influence in city gov and deaf social progress today we are going to discuss rachel arfa and social progress Rachel Arfa made the motion for the third group of deaf and hard of hearing attorneys to be sworn into the United States Supreme Court via the Deaf and Hard of Hearing Bar Association. Arfa served as president of the Deaf and Hard of Hearing Bar Association from 2019 until now. She is currently the highest ranking deaf person to serve in a city government role anywhere. Rachel serves as the commissioner for the mayor's office for people with disability in Chicago. She was in the first group of attorneys to be admitted to the U.S. Supreme Court via the Deaf and Hard of Hearing Bar Association. She discusses how having to self-advocate as a deaf person began an advocacy journey that led to becoming a lawyer, particularly with fighting for accommodations. Rachel attributes her career growth to being mentored and promotes how mentorship leads to social progression. Her goal is to open up pathways. I do think that the idea of having mentorship being key to social progress is really important because um, a lot of us, you know, we don't know what to do. We're kind of feeling hopeless and not a lot of people have mentorship. And so I do think, you know, her discussing that that's what helped her uh, make it through. It kind of, you know, makes you, when you think of that, want to, like, even if you don't have a mentor yourself, want to be for others what you never had for you in a way you know or to hopefully look for who might be a mentor to you already or think about ways people in your life have mentored you um and so what i was reading from in that uh video we just looked at and what we just talked about was this article of conversation with chicago um mopd commissioner rachel arfa and that's um mayor's office for people with disability and this is in a place called fun for the disabled um and so that's what we just discussed in that one minute video and i do think that that is fascinating um and next up i just want to look at the national association of the deaf and civil rights laws in terms of how the so we talked about like the social progress and the community organization um in terms of moving the needle with social progress and now i want to look at what were the laws and the physical actions that occurred in order for deaf people to start to get legal representation oh i meant to say in the united states today we're going to discuss civil rights laws pertaining to deafness I think I discussed this in my Deaf History Lessons 3, 7, and 10, but even though National Association of the Deaf claims to be the first human rights organization since 1880s, they did not allow Black people in until after 1960s Civil Rights Movement. National Association of the Deaf does take credit for a lot of um, involvement in passages of civil rights laws regarding deafness. I just don't understand how an organization that claims to be the first human rights organization can just not allow black people in for like 80 years, but okay. There are many laws that are influential in the deaf community that I recommend looking into. Some of those include, and of course are not limited to, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, Fair Housing Act, and Communications Act. And don't get me started on legal loopholes. So, yeah. Um, and that's what I was talking about here with these civil rights laws. That, and this is the article where the NAD is kind of taking credit for a lot of the passage of the civil rights law. But what's important to know is the precursor for all of these civil rights laws was a 1973 Rehab Act. And that was led by Brad Lomax of the Black Panthers. Um, 
And so he wasn't even deaf. And in the 1980s, National Association of the Deaf Formed, and I'm um, not National Association, I'm so sorry. I am looking at that page, and so I said it. I meant to say National Black Deaf Advocates Formed. Um, and in uh, around 1980s. And so I feel like that was where you start to see even more social progress because that is the community which we were able to get civil rights movements um, and laws and access to begin with. So National Association of the Deaf, after they banned black people from being allowed in for over a hundred years, they didn't take credit for black work in regards to the passage of the civil rights laws. And I, I find that fascinating because this is a deaf space and this is what advocacy looks like when it's white led. You know what I mean? Like we fucking um, look at what the fuck we're doing here. What the shit, man? What the shit? It's all about saviorism, making yourself look good. It's literally just about social signals. Like, do you even give a shit? What the fuck? Because they, uh, I don't know, I have some issues with Anna. And then I, that's why I am bringing all of this up, just because, um, you know, with these discrimination issues in place, you know, you kind of see that, like, when you have, um, National Association of the Deaf trying to take credit for the labor of disabled black people and black deaf people, um, it kind of lends you the question, how can you find community as a deaf person when this is the reality of the system, you know? Um, and I know I'm not the person that probably should be speaking on these issues. Um, so I'm not going to say too much more on that because I don't want to make it, I don't want to be taking over representation for others, but I still do want to highlight where I see problematic social issues. So I'm still trying to learn like that balance. So if I, you know, it's, it's a learning journey and I'm working on it. We're working on ourselves, so feel free to talk to me about these issues, too. Um, like, for example, like, I don't do well when hearing people try to talk to me about deaf issues because you have no lived experience on that. But at the same time, I'm a white person. I have no lived experience with racism. So if I'm trying to talk about my processing of my understanding of racism in my decolonizing journey, and that's ever inappropriate, of course I want to learn to do better. Not that anybody owes me anything, but... You know, I will always take something like that, like, you know what I mean, to heart. Um, because I feel like there really is no good way to learn how to do better on these social issues without, without trying, you know? Um, and another correlation I have here is I kind of believe that What about human rights evolution in Germany? You know what I mean? So, in the United States, what we see is multiple, the more multiply oppressed you are, um, the harder it is for you to get access in society, and people who share parts of your marginalized identity, if they're not as oppressed as you for other reasons, then they will use that shared common marginality to continue press to as an excuse to oppress you. You know what I mean? In a way. And I wonder if that happens in Germany as well, um, in terms of like a setback with their social evolution. Because you know, um, I feel like the whole concept, the discussions of anti-Semitism in today's climate are really, really difficult, particularly with the whole discussion of, of Palestine and free Palestine. 
Um, because these days, you know, when you're advocating for a free Palestine and you're speaking out against Zionism and against Nazis and things like that, you are considered anti-Semitic. And it's like I get that, you know, Jewish people have been oppressed. I do feel that isn't an excuse for a specific group of people to then go oppress others. It's not an excuse, and that is what is happening today. A specific group of people are using past oppression to go oppress others, which now makes them oppressors. You can have been oppressed in the past and become an oppressor now. It's the cycle of abuse, my dude. Um... So, I don't know. I've just been kind of reflecting on all of that lately, and I've been thinking about how I do feel for in Germany, though, because deaf people were, you know, sterilized and impacted by eugenics, and so were people who were Jewish. If you were deaf and Jewish in Germany, you must have been targeted even more. And I, I feel that probably there's like probably some similar correlations based on the similarities and the histories that I'm seeing overall. And I'm not saying that in a way to be like, let me compare the traumas of different groups of people. I'm saying that in a way to say, I believe it's all connected. And I don't know if that is appropriate um, or if there's a way I could be wording this better, but I do believe that regardless of if I'm in the wrong for how I'm wording this, starting these conversations is important to, in regards to reflecting on intersectionality and decolonizing and how decolonizing different parts of uh, discrimination can help in anti-discrimination in general. So moving on, I decided from there, like, let me look up deaf lawmakers in the U.S. because we're talking about how long it took um, for deaf people to uh, get in the United States. And from my understanding, in 2018, this one dude campaigned to be the first deaf lawmaker in the United States. Um, I know I can find on the search engine result page that there are deaf people in Congress. Um, I wanted to look at this article, but I can't see it, so we can't do that. So what was that dude's name? Oh, it's right in front of me. Okay, so... Okay, he lost. So this dude lost. But I don't know what year. I can see, like, so in that prior, so this is where I'm having, like, an issue here. I know that there are deaf lawyers. I can see here we've got deaf bitches in Congress, but I can't see what year in the United States the first people in Congress were put up in there. So I don't know what year um, we first got put into Congress. And if I figure that out after all of this, I'll probably just do like a follow-up little video and link it in the description or some shit. Um, because it tells you everything else, but does it tell you when was the first person put into Congress? Let's see. Oh, this is just an ad. Bruh. This is... 
Okay, well, right here, this shows this dude is a U.S. representative elected in 2010. I can't really find, figure out what year the first uh, disabled person was put into... Um, whatever, in the United States, but... What I don't understand is how are you campaigning to be the first deaf lawmaker in the U.S. in 2018 if there's already some, if there's already a congressperson in 2010, but maybe they didn't do their research or the SEO wasn't as good then. Um... Yeah. So, I'm just putting it out there. I don't know what year. I can't, I couldn't find like a, because no one, you know, no one really did SEO or gave a shit, I guess, when that happened. Um, for like what year, uh, there was a first deaf Congress person in the United States, but I do know we can find that documentation at least from 2010 or above. So I do like to think because we can see the legal precedent for what was happening in the United States, um, you know, uh, like, cause now there's like these organizations like deaf and government, you know, we have the deaf and hard of hearing bar association. So in America, we're getting like these legal um, and these social communities together in order to build mentors for each other so people can learn from each other. And I believe that that is also happening in Germany. Um, let's see here. Um, I'm going to save that link for later. It's like German deaf community. Oh, damn. There's only around 30,000 deaf people in Germany. Hearing impaired is considered a slur, by the way. We do not use that. Um, we are just deaf. Some people identify as hard of hearing because they want you, because it's such a conundrum fuck having to explain to people that deafness is a spectrum. People say you're hard of hearing because people don't fucking understand that deafness is a spectrum. But yeah, um... Let's look at deaf organizations in Germany, published by Gaida University, of course. Um, oh, no, nothing there. Okay, so yeah, I'm not seeing, oh, there's a German Association of the Deaf. Here we go. No, uh, I can't fucking open it. You know what, Philip? That I don't want to open right now. I don't have a uh, Microsoft Office on this computer. Life is hard. That was a document. Okay, so yeah, it's hard to find like the same um, like legal or community associations. There's like professional association of German deaf educators. There's a German deaf association. They have. Okay, they got 16 national associations and 10 national trade associations with more than 600. Can I open this online? Like, do I have to? Oh, God damn it. That's unfortunate. It just keeps sending me a fucking document that I can't open. That's fine. Fuck you too, bitch. Um, so yeah, I don't know much about German deaf associations, but I like to think that it is related to and connected to, um, what is happening in the United States. I personally believe because of the way that the sign language ban and the eugenics movement happened first in America um, and then seeped into Germany in this scenario, that, you know, we can kind of look at American history and then we can look at what's happening in Germany and it's like they're kind of following along in terms of their social progress within the deaf sphere. I don't know about all other political or social issues. This is strictly a deaf community 
legal and historical analysis. Um, but I kind of think that's fascinating how what is happening in one place of the road impacts what's happening in another place of the road. And I said road, not road. Um, but yeah, fucking dude. And I'm fascinated by that. And that goes back into, I've did a, uh, video called this Mernie Ann video, what I don't like about Mernie Ann 83, uh, because of her teaching sign language wrong, and culturally appropriating and some other shit. But in there I did, um, a breakdown of this one article that this chick wrote on my website and she lives in the UK and she's like a decade younger than me. And I think it's fascinating because she was speaking about the death history and the consequences and ramifications of death history. I said death, not de dust. D E A F. Okay. Of death history. Sorry, captions. Um, in UK. And I fucking thought that was crazy that, like, what was happening on there was literally my experience. But she's on the other side of the road and 10 years later. You know what I mean? Like, she's like 5 to 10 years younger than me. Um, and that still blows my mind. I'm still working on decolonizing my language. Like, I just noticed I said that was crazy. I'm trying not to say that shit anymore because I think that might be ableist. But, you know, it's like you can be recognizing the harm in social issues and still working on yourself. And I don't like this idea where people are like, oh, well, if you're not perfect, you can't talk about social issues. No one's fucking perfect, bitches. And that's not the fucking point of talking about social issues. It's not to hold anybody to perfection. It's just about processing what are the consequences of our actions. And to be honest, I would rather be around imperfect people who give a fuck about social issues than people who don't give a fuck about social issues trying to be perfect. Um, so yeah, I'm going to end it there. Thank you so much for joining me today. I am going to play some outros to make sure I don't get cut off here. Um, please be sure to adjust your volume on your computer if you need to. This, some loud music might pop in after this little outro thingy. But um, thank you so much again for watching today. And I hope you have a great day. It's the end of the video. The end of the world is here. Um, you can sign up for my loyalty program at heladeathchild.com slash loyalty. Um, and you get points for showing up to these lives. You get points just for being here that you can then redeem for discounts on my store. So think about that. Um, I've been having some problems with cutting myself off before I meant to end the live. So I'm going to uh, play a little promo now just to make sure, you know, I'd rather have this playing at the end than um, accidentally keep cutting myself off again. So hopefully this strategy will prevent me from cutting myself off from now on. So, and this is what I'll probably do from now on. Anywho, I appreciate you so much for being here. Thank you for your time today and I hope you have a great day.